Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. This is Cruise Trading Frank on Super Bowl Sunday. We're going to keep this uh, within the next 60 minutes. We all have to uh, ready for the pre-ball uh, 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 parties, right? Um, this is going to be one heck of a game coming up tonight. So I'm sure even people who are not football fans um, are going to enjoy uh, what's coming in front of us. So I'll, I'll keep it to the point. Um, let me take a quick roll call. Uh, we have our great uh, and loyal member, uh, Jody. Uh, Jody, can you hear us? I can hear you, Frank. Thank you, sir. Great hearing your voice again. I hope all's well with you and your family. Um, we have uh, uh, we have Joseph, uh, a new uh, and uh, and a very passionate learner, new member. Uh, we have our good friend Mike. Uh, we have uh, Trent. Trent, can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Uh, no, Mike. No problem, Trent. Uh, just make sure that you can see uh, hear the, hear the audio visual. I mean, see the audio, uh, hear the audio, and and uh, and see the visual screen in the back because uh, that's the most important part of this of this particular session. And uh, we finally have uh, um, our uh, long time uh, uh, my long time friend and member uh, swimming the market, Tom. Okay, we should be good. Let me just do one final thing on my other screen because we'll be reviewing that and we'll start. Okay, so so let me begin. So good afternoon again. Today is uh, the 4th of February 2018, approximately 4.41 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is a free uh, market and stock update webinar. Very, very important given the uh, dynamics of the market and the and the and the uh, many crash. I should say. Well, it's a crash. Uh, we're down uh, almost 1,100 points on the Dow um, for the week. Not in a straight line, but that's the way it goes. Um, very, very important uh, uh, update and uh, the few cents of uh, wisdom and experience that I can provide at these critical times. Um, hopefully should be helpful uh, to everyone and uh, helpful to me. Um, this session will be recorded and uploaded to the Clue to Trading YouTube channel. Um, and it will be available for viewing uh, for free to anyone out there, uh, member or non-member. Um, Full disclosure, this is purely for financial education and not for any solicitation or advice, uh, and we shall begin. Please stop me at any given time with questions, um, but first let me just go through a series of very important charts uh, from a technical standpoint. Uh, and like I always say, we try to keep our emotions aside uh, at all times, but especially at times like this, I do realize we are, after all, human traders. And when money is at risk and positions are upside down for no fault of ours, uh, then we have to uh, understand uh, what the background is so we can react accordingly coming up starting tomorrow. That's what matters. There are no easy answers uh, during a, uh, uh, a panic stage or capitulation stage of the market. However, uh, I did predict that something like this would happen. I will be honest with you, the speed and the ferocity of the drop, uh, especially on Friday, um, and we're going to go through a basic unmarked, unstructured chart first, uh, and then we're going to go through my structured charts that the speed and the ferocity of the move did take me by surprise. There is no question about it. I've always been a straight shooter and a straight talker, and I will tell you it definitely took me by surprise. Um, but we'll discuss that uh, uh, shortly. So first of all, there are uh, multiple reasons. As you know from my previous broadcast and webinars, I did predict and I shouldn't say I'm happy about the fact that my predictions are coming true, but I did predict that a sharp rate of change or a sharp rise on the 10-year government bond uh, would cause a short-term, and the key is short-term, uh, movement on the market, uh, which would, uh, 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 which would uh, be negative. Uh, and you guys all know that. Uh, my job at Clueless State Trading, as you know, is to forecast different probabilities of and possibilities of what can happen in the market. And uh, your job uh, as a member is to uh, use your own uh, 
decision-making process also uh, to act accordingly. I do want to make that very, very clear. Uh, remember, we're not a ditto trading service. I'm not trading your trading book. You're not trading my trading book. So how you react to certain situations, you have to be prepared to make your own decisions too. If you feel at any given time that, you know, just a gut feeling, um, and I'll be very straightforward about this, that, that doesn't matter what the technical charts say, um, that you feel that the market is going down or the market is going up, then you will have to react accordingly. Uh, there's no two ways about it. Um, and, uh, and that is part of your decision-making process. So keep that in mind going forward, uh, that you can you have to make your own decisions also based on all the tools and based on what I am putting through on my charts. And um, and that would be, you know, in some cases uh, can be helpful to you. No question about that. So saying all that, there's a couple of reasons. One of the one of uh, 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 an important reason. And please review the TNX uh, webinar video that was posted, I believe, two weeks ago explaining the ramifications of a very fast moving uh, increase in um, in the 10 gov year government bond yield or the overall increase in rates on the uh, treasury yields, whether it's the two year, whether it be the five year, whether it be the 10 year, whether it be the 30 year treasury yields. And uh, the fact that when treasury yields are rising rapidly, uh, this is a very sharp uh, uh, move then you are going to see a corresponding decrease because it's inversely proportional. In simple English, it's opposite to each other. A move up in yields, you have to move the decimal point, if you recall, one, on, uh, one uh, uh, to, uh, to the left, uh, one decimal point. So it's 2.854%. You can see that instead of 28%, it's not 28%, 2.854%. Um, then you are going to see a opposite negative reaction on the bond prices because yields and prices move opposite to each other right so if this is happening this sharp move is happening um then obviously the prices this is the yield then the prices are dropping accordingly that causes pressure just like a stock when prices are dropping accordingly either we're getting stopped out based on our own risk uh, risk uh, tolerance level, right? Uh, the same thing is happening on the bond market side or the credit side. And that is ca causing prices to collapse, uh, not collapse, but fall sharply. And, uh, and they get stops triggered, margin sellouts. Keep in mind, just like in the stock market, people buy stocks on margin, okay? Big players, hedge funds buy on margin. And uh, when you're at margin, in the case of the bond market, I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but the margin requirements are lower. In stocks, it's generally for the average uh, uh, trader, you have to put up a 50% capital in order to uh, uh, in order to have a, a, a and borrow 50% that the that the uh, that the, the margin rules allow you. Um, in the case of the in the case of bonds, this is in the case of stocks. In the case of bonds, I believe the requirements is 20% or something like that. I have to check on that. And you can borrow 80%. So if prices are falling rather rapidly, and this is a pure technical function of prices, then you are getting stopped out. You are getting big margin sellouts. And, and and they are selling, they are forcibly selling your positions against you so that you don't get a big, huge margin calls and you're upside down. And the margin uh, 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 desks on the large market making desks do not want to be uh, held hostage over the weekend or overnight with you owing not you necessarily, but the hedge funds and the large bond players holding millions and millions of dollars in margin calls so they they forcibly sell you out and the last 20 minutes or half an hour of the market which we will look at on the on the stock side was exactly that they just let it go it does not portend a trend per se it is a technical function that's why the last 20 
25 minutes, even though the market was starting to sort of base itself at around down 450, whatever, it just went boom. And that's when the margin sellouts happen in, 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 you know, and the machines just go on a, on a sell mode because they don't want uh, their customers, which happen to be the hedge funds and the big bond players. We're not big bond buyers, right? Um, so, um, and neither are most retail investors. They don't want to be, uh, they don't want to hold that uh, a margin call and they, uh, the margin clerks forcibly cause these massive sellouts. That's the simple reason for those rapid decline and the markets just go nuts over like a 15, 20 minute period. So the bottom line is that there are significant margin sellouts that are happening on the bond market because of rising interest rates, rising yields that causes prices on the bonds to drop, just like a stock, which causes margin sellouts and and enforceable, you know, uh, um, uh, well, that's what it is, forcible, you know, forced margin sellouts. And that affects, um, that affects, that has a ripple effect on stocks too, because a hedge fund, for example, let's say they own 30% bonds. And this is the reality of what happens in the market. Some for bonds, I'm just going to put B. They they own 30% uh, uh, stocks and uh, let, I'm sorry, 30% bonds. And uh, let's say they own 70% stocks. Well, it's in the same portfolio, right? So if the bond prices are dropping, dropping rapidly, it's also having a corresponding effects on stocks for no reason, for no reason, just a technical reason. And they are forced to sell both the bond side and the stock side to make sure that their, that their portfolio uh, is, uh, is maintained and that the portfolio is uh, not in a heavy negative, I'm going to put it like that, negative position. They try to balance it. So it affects across the board. And explain all that very clearly on that TNX video. It's not a pleasant phenomena. I've seen it. This is not the first time it's happening, you know, just so you know that. Every time that the, a, cri a mini crisis appears, um, uh, it seems like it's different. It's never different, guys. Okay. Every time, and I've always said this both in life and in trading, every crisis feels different. But like I used to tell my uh, institutional clients a long time ago on Wall Street, every crisis is the same for different reasons. This reason that we are going through, and now we're uh, we head into the the one of the uh, primary reasons, is uh, is has to do with the fact that um, it's it's basic. We had this back in 2015. We had this in 2016. Um, it's a rate tantrum. The fear that rates are going to be on a runaway train, and that they're never going to you know they're just going to keep on going higher and higher. It doesn't work like that. But the but the the panic situation is the stage we're in right now. OK, just want to be clear about that. I want you guys to understand it. The better off we can understand what the dangers are, the better off we can react what we need to do. We can need if we need to, we'll go into cash and just sit there, you know, and uh, and, and, and let the let the storm pass. Um, or you can do some limited shorts, but I don't know how well that's going to work, given some of the charts I'm going to show you, which are at extreme. I mean, extreme technical oversold levels, which stop me and I'm not that stupid a guy, which stopped me from putting in some heavy shorts out there. Um, and again, I have a right to change my mind depending on what starts off tomorrow. Um, but overall, because I'm going to get blasted. So, uh, because those extreme conditions generally uh, 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 trigger off a technical dead cat, what they call a dead cat bounce, which can be pretty ferocious. And your, your, your puts will basically go to zero. So let's look at the bond side here. So you can clearly see here from the charts that um, uh, you can clearly see here from the charts that we have uh, one second that we have uh, we have a breakout. Okay, it's pretty clear. This is a this is basically a cup and handle. Uh, a uh, just like you know chart patterns don't change. So whether it be bonds or stocks. So you got a, You got a um, you got a large. W formation with it with a uh, double bottom. Here's one bottom, which was back on uh, the 
back in uh, this is a, a year. So this is uh, 2012, 2013, 2017, 2018. These are years, right? Not days. So uh, we had one bottom back on um, 2012. We had a massive uh, a rate, a, 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 what do you call it? a taper tantrum, they called it at that time, that the Fed was going to move away. And uh, some of you might remember that term or Google it. Then you have, what's this for? Bear with me. Okay, that's better. Sorry about that. Double bottom, large W formation. Short term, you have a cup with a handle. Just like many stocks that we have played successfully. Uh, it's a cup and a handle and a breakout. This is a multi-year downtrend line going back to 2009 when rates were at 4.32% on the 10-year government bond, which is extremely important to all of us because all the consumer rates are directly keyed off that, keyed off this and LIBOR, the London Interbank Offering Rate, which is not used as much because of some of the scandals that happened and the manipulation that took place back in um, years ago. Anyway, don't want to get into that right now. So the 10-year government bond is the direct measure that other consumer rates are tied off, whether it be a credit card rates, mortgage rates, auto loan rates, uh, 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 business loan rates, you name it, right? So um, things that matter to us. And uh, breakout over this downtrend line from 2009, that breakout happened here and is now above this level. Technically speaking, you can see here very clearly that we are going to be hitting the upper end of this cup or pattern completion as you call it, as we call it that is that approximately 3% 3.04% somewhere around there okay that's maximum Ups, max upside, as I'd like to call it. So let's do a quick math here. We are right now at 2.854. If we go to, and this will directly affect the markets, okay, as it is doing that. So it's very important that you guys understand what I'm talking about, which is not hard. It's a rise of approximately 0.196 or another 196 basis points. So 0.96 divided by, I'm doing the percentage calculation now, 0.854, that's a rise of another, the move from here where the markets close, uh, where we closed that on Friday, which was at 2.854%. Uh, what happened? Hold on one second. My system, bear with me. Bear with me, that's one of my screens basically decided to just do its own thing. Hold on. Apologize about that. This is what we were doing. Where is this? Give me one second. And I'm going to change the screen while I fix this. I'm going to leave it on the McClellan oscillator. Did everyone's uh, screens change? Um, yeah. Okay, good. Because I'm just fixing it on the other side. Don't know why it's not coming up. Okay, give me a second. I'm almost there. Oh, 
that's what happens when you work with multiple screens. Sometimes they uh, just once in a while, for whatever reason, they switch around. Okay, good. I'm back to where I was. Ten-year chart. Okay, good. Okay, I'm changing back the screens right now. Let me know if everyone is back on the... Is everyone back on the TNX screen? Yes. Okay, good, good, thank you. All right, let's 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 uh, focus here. Apologize for that technical issues. So bottom line is that uh, from here to here, uh, we are talking about another rise of roughly, percentage-wise, the movement from uh, 2.854 to 3.06 or whatever uh, is roughly 7%. So yields can rise not in, actu in, in absolute terms, but in the rate of change or percentage terms can rise another 7% to 3.04%. Does everyone understand that part? What I just said? Yes? Yes? No? Yes. Okay, good. It's simple stuff. I just want to make sure that no one's confused. The yields are not going to 7%. In that case, we're toast, okay? Then you can just short and go away for the next four months. Uh, I, what I'm talking about is yields, uh, if they rise up to pattern completion rate uh, movement to 3%, that means it's a rate of change or the actual change is a 7% increase from 2.854 to 3.04. Looking at the chart, it looks like that's where we're going to go. However, keep in mind, life ain't that simple, right? If everybody's expecting something that clear, then it just doesn't happen. But we have to keep that in mind. We have to keep that in mind. Now, this is a weekly chart, so things are a lot more smoother. Remember, when we look at weekly charts on stock, they look pretty nice. So many of our stocks, I'll show you a monthly uh, chart of the S&P 500. You don't even see the technical damage that took place last week. That's serious. So, so this is a this is literally a monthly chart, or year, uh, you know, going back, um, going back to October of 2009. So the bottom line is that um, you know, going back eight years. So the point is that uh, uh, everything looks pretty smooth. Like, oh wow, look at that candle, and it's going straight up. This is not a one day thing. This is happening over months. The speed of ascent. When you see bars like this, let's zoom in a little bit. Okay is what is scaring the markets. And for reasons, not necessarily that this is scare, but the technical reason which I explained earlier, bond prices are falling rapidly, large amounts, billions and billions of dollars in certain portfolios are getting hit. Don't forget, bonds are held substantially by banks, right? Banks hold a lot of fixed income bonds. So their portfolios are getting hit. They're forced to sell those bonds too, in order to, you know, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, not uh, create an upside down margin risk where they owe billions of dollars because they, you know, they borrow to borrow those, buy those bonds. And subsequently, they're selling stocks too. Some of the th stocks. You notice that some of the stocks are not even getting hit. There are a whole bunch of biotech stocks that are green on a day like Friday, which was one of the worst days I've seen since I don't even know. You know, as if the world was going to end. But hey, I don't control the market. So, uh, uh, but then pockets of other stocks, the name brand ones getting hit. Facebook still up. Amazon still up. Data and those type of companies which had solid earnings. Deckers, you know, the makers of Ugg boots up. Now, multiple stocks were up, believe it or not. So it's not like they're selling everything lock, stock and barrel. But when ETFs or exchange traded funds are being sold. The, the the basket uh, the stocks that they own within those baskets are equally being sold systematically technically for no fundamental reason so this is what we're watching right so let's zoom in a little bit closer to see what this picture looks like let's say on a daily basis so on a daily basis you're seeing that breakout too right 
Now let's look to see on an intraday basis. On an intraday basis, we did have some selling, meaning, I'm sorry, uh, the bond yields start to ease at around 12 noon. And then it looks like around one o'clock, they started to, bond deals started to go up again. And uh, this was the final hour uh, between 2 and 4 p.m. Friday uh, where they moved up. So obviously, you know, markets got pressured again. Let's look at this on a 15 minute basis. This is the 15 minute chart. Let's look at it on a five minute basis pictures kind of saying the same story that there was some pr big pressure towards the last half an hour to 45 minutes giving the real reasons why the market fell like that felt like that sorry fell like that at the at the end now let's look at some technicals here this is the technical picture this is the actual technical picture the actual technical picture on the overall is extreme and you, this, you'll see the difference between exact opposite of what's happening with stocks. You're seeing an extreme reaction, and the, and it's hitting close to a hundred on the false stochastics. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't make these things up. Okay, this is technical stuff. You we are hitting false stochastics at a hundred. That is just like, you know, you could overshoot a little bit, but that's just like saying that. It's just gonna, you know, that's one of the most extreme readings on the overbought side on the bond on the bond deals that has been detected since 2009 remember this is 2009 do you guys remember it is eight that's nine years ago nine years ago in october 2009 the 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 rapid rise in in bond deals we can see that here um we hit stochastics hit less than that it hit uh, look on the right hand side here hit 9.2 percent i'm sorry 92 right there look at that number here on the scale 92 now we're at 98 so if to take that into account we're getting close to a tradable bottom and a tradable top in bond deals bond deals look like they are going to go to three percent but in order for it to do that, it's got to eat, it's, it's just got to pause a little bit. And if it just happens like that this following week or the next couple of days, then it's unheard of. Unheard of. That means bond prices are going to collapse tremendously. We're going to move very rapidly to the sidelines in cash. And we're just going to let that float, put a couple of small shorts out there and just sit back. Because there is no fundamental or technical chart that's going to help you maintain any any reasonable sense on our portfolios. Aside from if you, maybe we'll get like a, a bunch of biotech buyouts in the middle of another uh, you know another three hundred point drop in the market. That's serious. It's happened before. All right, I've seen it all. But the point is that you want at that point just move away. You get, you got to, doesn't matter what, how much you're down on your portfolio. I got hit too. Okay. So it's not like, oh, wow. You know, I got a couple of winners. I got hit hard on, 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 on a bunch of stuff and there's nothing you can do. So the bottom line is that, uh, you, you want to, you want to basically just move back. So these are very extreme levels. And, and when you get towards that levels, uh, if you are, let's say, uh, shorting bonds, uh, let's say, you know, we don't short bonds, but we're shorting bonds uh, because, you know, prices are dropping. Then you better be careful because you're hitting close to 9,800. So I just want to be clear about that. Overall trend is shown. We're going to go to with three, but um, but we shall, you know, but it's not, you know, again, there'll be a little zigzag. And it very well could be this. It very well could be that we have the first stage of pattern completion here. Right there, that's the first stage of the pattern completion. We create another handle. That'll give us some room. That when if we create another handle, and I want people to think and answer because everything is tied up. If we now we're at 2.854, and let's say we create a handle, and that handle brings us down to 2. Point, I'm sorry, it it hit here. So I'm using this as reference point. It pulls us back again to that breakout level. Remember, stocks break out and then they create a little bit more of a high. Imagine this to be a stock. Then what do they do? They come and retest where they broke out from. 
So technically, bond yields can do the same. There's nothing different about that. So if it comes and retests that 2.637 level, what is that going to do on the other side for the equity market? Think and answer, because this is if you don't understand this basic correlation, then I, 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 you know, a friendly suggestion in a good way. Just do not trade these markets whatsoever. So I ask that question again. You have to understand this. One of the most important pieces of what I need to make people understand um, going into this week. So if we, if this is pattern completion here, that and it creates, you know, it's a, it's a large cup, and it creates a handle before it heads towards the three percent level, and bond deals ease back. What is that going to do on the front end of the equity markets? Uh, somebody step up and answer because we don't have all night here. I explain all this very, very clearly. This is so simple. I mean, dead serious. I'm, I don't, I, I don't mean to, and you know, I'm, a, I'm a decent guy. But guys, if you don't understand this common sense stuff, uh, just please do not trade. Stock market's gonna bounce up. Thank you. It's real simple. Bond deals, this sharp rise in bond deals are causing the stock market disruptions on a short term basis. So if I'm saying that if bond deals basically have created this is this is pattern one completion, pattern two completion takes us to three percent. We're going to three percent. But before we get to three percent, just like a stock, a stock creates a cap, very sharp rise. Then it creates a profit taking because right now for people who have shorted bonds, bonds, OK. Um, especially the large institutions or whatever, they are basically going to say, wow, I just made a ton of money on the short side as bond prices have come down. So I'm going to take some of my profits, right? That's what shorts do. When we short something, we take profits on certain tactical levels. And sometimes we see gold lower. And we say, oh boy, why now hold on? But that's not what we're talking about here. So they're going to say, you know, I'm going to take profit. That will create a downward pressure on government bonds Eels, government bond rates. That's going to cause government bond prices to have a short-term reprieve, or like, okay, they're going to move government bond prices. They're going to move up a little bit. P will move up. Bond prices will move up a little bit. Bond yields are going to ease back a little bit. The stock market, I'm going to put it as S or ST, will move up a little bit before it starts to move back up again, because that's what cup and handles do, right? Cup, consolidation, and then it breaks out. It follows the primary trend, which is higher, and then it will head towards the 3%. So everyone's clear on this, right? If anyone's not clear on this, I'm not going to spend all night explaining it because I've already done my job of explaining it. All right? It's really simple. And if you don't understand this basic correlation, ladies and gentlemen, do not. I don't care what you do. You are going to, you, you, you know, it, you just don't trade these markets because it's very, very important, very critical. All right, let's move on. So that's the bond part, what's going on. All right? Just want to be clear on that. And review my TNX video. That explains it all on this site. Now, I'm not a bond expert. I do know that there is an emotional panic going on on the bond side. There are fundamental reasons. One of the reasons is that wage pressures increased. That the Friday jobs number showed that. But there is a reason for one of the reasons, too, why the wage pressures increased, believe it or not. It was a seasonal factor, which I don't want to get into right now. And the seasonal factor was a lot of workers, because of the heavy snow and stuff, couldn't get to work. So they had to basically pay the ones who were working at that time a slightly higher wages because the other guys couldn't get to work. All right. And one of the smartest guys on Bloomberg mentioned this. I'm like, that kind of makes sense a little bit, because let me be honest with you. Do you really think that American wages are moving up like clockwork? A guy making like 12 bucks an hour all of a sudden is making 30 bucks an hour. Does anyone believe that? I don't care what the political guys, the, uh, the political say from Washington, D.C., the wage pressure overall in the U.S. has moved up, but it is not shooting up. 
the McDonald's guy who got like a five, uh, three dollar or four dollar raise, or a Walmart guy who got a three, four, five dollar raise, is not all of a sudden rich. Am I right or wrong? Okay, so I don't care what your political affiliations are. We are seeing wage pressure, which is gaining across corporate America, which is a good thing overall. We all want people to make a little bit more money, but it is not stratospherically rising. If you're on the high end of the scale, an educated engineer, tech guy, somebody with solid, solid high end skills. Yeah, your wages are rising pretty fast because they can't find enough uh, uh, educated uh, um, uh, science and technology workers, STEM, what they call it, science, technology, engineering and math workers to fill the jobs. So all that screaming and shouting uh, that uh, that we all do make America great again. You got to have real educated workers. American and uh, real educated workers. So guys sitting around dropping out of high school and smoking meth is not going to do the job. You know, I've always said that, right? Get real educated, get those work like a dog all through your young lives to make, uh, you know, to, um, to, 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 to get that education and your wages will rise rapidly. But the overall American worker wages are not rising like crazy. Now, why am I saying that? Because the biggest thing you're hearing about in the market with the so-called bears and the pundits, and I'm no certainly a bear, I'll tell you that. This is a corrective pullback. I've gone through many of these. That's why I say things with confidence. And many of you who've been with me know that too. I don't shy away. Neither am I that stupid. I have to uh, take, I have to notice that the dangers that might lie ahead. So bottom line is that the way they're saying wages are just shooting up like crazy. Yeah, right, they are. All of a sudden, the guy in McDonald's is in, instead of driving a basic car or no car, is driving a BMW, Mercedes, or a Maserati. Right? Come on, so don't listen to that fluff that you hear. Or some guy, you know, even Trump sometimes like, oh, you know, these guys are making so much more money. No, they're not. Let's face facts. Is the U.S. economy better? Absolutely. Is his business-friendly policies great for America? I absolutely believe so. But is it going to rapidly change the fate of the average American worker? Excuse my French. Bull crap. Neither will be the tax changes. The tax changes are great for U.S. business, and I'm 100% for it because I truly believe that U.S. business helps, and as a capitalist should believe, helps overall the U.S. worker. That's supply side economics, and I'm a big believer of that. But will it immediately affect and make the average worker like feel, you know, just because they got a thousand dollar bonus? Yeah, great. No, let's move on. So one of the questions that uh, one of our new members asked said, like, wow, you know, look at this, look at this market. Uh, you know, why didn't we go totally short on that stuff? It's never that easy. And let me explain to you why. Because I, I'm, all, I'm in the business of making money, right? I'm not in the business of hiding under a rock. You guys know that. I'm always there. I'm the, I don't disappear. When everyone else disappears, I'm the only one putting out what I'm doing. My job is to put out there what I think is going on. It's up to you sometimes to make your own decisions. But at the same time, let me explain why. If you look at this is just a, this is a complete, excuse my French, this is just a complete naked chart without any structure on it, right? So this was nine o'clock on Friday. So let's do this very carefully so all of you will think, put things in perspective. And that was a very good question. It was asked by our new member, Amin. So I do appreciate you asking that, sir. So um, so this was uh, the following day, uh, uh, the second. This was second. Do I have a pen? Very important. OK, this was Friday, three in the morning, six in the morning, nine in the morning, 930 with the market start. OK, this was uh, the following day when the markets closed. Around four. OK, this is 4 p.m. This is 4 p.m. on Thursday. Please let, look at this carefully, because this is very important for you to realize why this job is not an easy job. In hindsight, everything's 2020. But in the reality of the battlefield on the ground, I have to make a determination what I think is going on. And I can be wrong sometimes because markets, when they're uncontrollable and in, in panic mode. What am I supposed to do? Panic and be uncontrollable too? No, sorry, you can't get that from me. And and net net, eventually I win. Question is, are you going to be in that winning trade? That's up to you, not me. So this was Friday. So I'm going to put F. This is Thursday. 
So here was Thursday. We closed at 4 p.m. This was the close. 4 p.m. It's kind of a messy 4, but this is where we are. So at 4 p.m. we closed. And uh, right around here. And the markets after hours were up here. So this overall, let's look at patterns now, is a trading range. The upper end of the trading range is approximately 2840. And this was shown on multiple charts that I've showed. And I'm just showing you in the basic one, right? And it looked like we had a good eight points or so before we hit the sales button again. So from a tactical trading standpoint, we bought the lows. And we're waiting for a pop towards getting there to sell. Basic range trading. Everyone with me so far? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. So we're in basic range trading here. Then around 9 in the evening, remember, at this point, it's out of our hands because it's after hours. There was a sell-off. Early in the morning, 2, 3 in the morning, they're starting to move. This is all happening after hours. Remember, this is where the market started Whoa. in the morning. Ah. What a mess. Hold on. Yeah, I'm just going to keep it like that. This is where the market started in the morning on Thursday. Range trading. Range told us that we had six or seven more points. So we positioned accordingly. I'm talking about the overall market. This, ladies and gentlemen, is completely out of your hand. We can't do anything about it. Because it's after hours. So unless you're a futures trader, which I wish that I was at these days, and I think I will very shortly, in that case, in the daytime, you're going to see, I'm going to be posting, but you're going to see much engagement from me because I'll probably be dead tired. But if I was a futures trader, future trader, then I'd be just like, great. I'd be shorting it here because the range breakdown that happened around 4.30 in the morning, 5. That's why my eyes open up like around 4.35. Don't ask me why. Well, because the European markets are opening up at that time. I checked things. There was a range breakdown. A move towards going up there before we are opening. This is the U.S. opening at, at around 9, 9.30. So there's a, there's, a, there's a move up from the retest of the 2800 level. And this is directly directed to the question that our great member, Amin, asked me on text. Okay? So it's moving up here, looking like they're going to they're gonna basically uh, uh, start to move things higher then comes the wage uh, the 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 the, the uh, jobs number so all of a sudden they sold so if you shorted right when the market opened and now i'm showing you from the point that the market opened this is the reality of what's going on guys not what you think by looking at something after the fact is like oh my god look at that you know we made like a billion bucks yeah sure wouldn't i have loved to have made that but did I know? No. And I'll tell you why. So here, if you, this is where the market opened. Right after the market opened, there was a spike. And that spike was good for approximately three to four S&P points. But you can see the candles. You can see the candles. This is where the market opened. Boom. Short covering. That's a hammer reversal. So what do you do? You short a hammer reversal? No, I, I wouldn't want to do that. Because I don't know if this hammer is going to basically go up here find some support and then go up and hit the the uh, 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 what do you call two uh, two a.m. This is two a.m. at night. This is two a.m. at night, which was around twenty eight twenty. And get back in this range that it broke after. Sorry about that. After hours. I don't know that. Right here, another cell candle. Very happening very rapidly, mind you very rapidly now in between we had a couple of strong earnings winners i want to point out that because i'm not going to shy away from our winners dat whether you did or not is not my concern it's what i put out there apple i don't go hard in it i had the lottos got blasted on them and the apple looked like beautiful because the night before i forgot to mention the biggest thing can anyone tell me the night before at the close on thursday at 6 p.m., 
What was going on with some of the biggest stocks in the market? Apple. Somebody please tell me. What happened to Apple after earnings? And I need an answer, otherwise I'm wasting my time with all of you. It went down at first and then it rebounded real hard up. Thank you. It rebounded hard. Apple was up almost $6. Six frigging dollars. And when a stock rebounds like that, generally speaking, does it immediately? This is complete aberration. This is all to do with that big bond stuff going on. Does it immediately reverse at in the negative at the open? No. That's one of the rarest chances. And it happened. Did it shock me? Totally shocked me. Like, whoa, it was up six. And then it was still up about a dollar at the open. Then it started going negative. What happened with Amazon? After earnings on Thursday, please answer, guys, because this is a, this. My job is to educate you guys. So you guys are not lost in a la la world of what you think. What happened to Amazon after earnings? Went higher, way higher. Higher? It went nuts. It was up almost 100 points from the bottom or 120 points. Thank you. Huge. Google dropped and then bounced hard after hours too. At one <laughs> point, it was only down 20 points. 20 points in Google is nothing. Guys, 20 points in Google is nothing. Okay? I had some Amazon. Wish that I had more Amazon. I had two contracts of Google got, you know, they got blasted. I bought a little common of Google at the uh, uh, during after hours, made some money on it. A couple of common shares because it bounced pretty hard. In the meantime, other earnings like we uh, like we alerted DATA and Decker's Outdoor, they just went berserk, up 10, up 9. So it looked like a pretty good opening. Look, I'm just a trader just like you guys. So I'm feeling pretty good. I'm like, okay, I'm going to take a hit on that side on Google, but I'm, I'm up on all this other stuff, well, uh, feeling good. And then I wake up at like, I mean, I, I check the stuff that I always do at like 4.30, 4.45. It's like futures are down like six or seven. Okay, futures bounce too. Futures were down nine and then they moved up after hours. Okay, then they moved up after hours. This is six o'clock close, uh, six o'clock close and then they moved up. They were down nine and then they, then they were only down two. I'm like, okay, it's looking good. It's within the range. We're going to be okay. And then at around 2.30 in the morning, Asian markets started to puke. And that was the puke. And it started to get in there early in the morning before 9 o'clock. So it's a very difficult scenario. I want you to understand that. So it's not like, oh, I'm just going to short everything. Yeah, short everything. In the meantime, it looks like almost 80% probability we're going to hit that 28.40 uh, level where I, we would be sellers. That's what tactical traders do, especially on the index, you know, the SPX and, and the RUT and stuff like that. Even here, so all this started happening, right? So even here, during the day, went down, sharp reversal higher. Let me clean out this. First, the hammer reversal. Second, from the same type of level, it lo it's looking like another W formation coming up. Nope, they, they started hitting it here. This by, by this time, it is approximately 145 in the afternoon, right there. This is what you call a postmortem, right? Or a off a off off a off a crime scene. This is war, what the what the what do you call it? The after action review. Yes, after action review. Or what do you call it? Like the uh, you know when they arrive at the scene. This is the crime scene analysis. All right. So it then then they bring then the then some bunch of selling here. Now remember, this is a this is a 15 minute chart, so it's a heck of a lot more choppy. In the meantime, 
I'm scaling in a couple of things that I'm finding some value in, which were acting fine till the till the, the, the late afternoon. I'm not liking the action of the S&P, but at the same time, these are for next week. Um, and so I'm like, OK, let me try to scale in a little bit. Then these things happen and then approximately around 145, we get a fat, fat movement, a candle. That gets hit. And, and then around two o'clock, then again, another hammer reversal here. Then approximately around three o'clock, that's when they let it go. And the reasons of that were fully explained in the first 20 minutes of the session. So that is the reality of what's going on. So if I thought, okay, looking at the overall picture of what was going on, and let me now look at a one hour chart of the fact that this is the waterfall decline um, in the hourly, big hammer reversals, pullbacks, green candles, and then basically around one, two o'clock, this was, this was the reason. This was when the big margin sellouts hit. Now, sometimes I do some very fast trades, like one of our great members who is not here right now, uh, 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 Fish Eyes mentioned, he did some quick short trades too, and he sold out a little bit early. I did a couple of quick short scalps on the SPX intraday lottos. Okay, while building and build and uh, pulling in my position because the SPX position I started adding late in the day. The RUT positions was the one that I was scaling in and bringing my cost lower. So you guys can do that. One thing I want to make very clear, and we are entering, we have always been in a critical market. You know, markets have always been volatile, all right? Yeah, the 700 points was an aberration, but markets have always been volatile. I want to make something very clear. It is your decision what you do. And it's also very important that you are not mimicking every single thing that I'm doing. How is that physically possible? Am I running your trading book? I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you the facts here. You got to run your own trading book. If you feel very uncomfortable about a position, if you don't have the risk tolerance, and rightfully so, that you can handle more than a 40, 50% drop on an options position. Look, I can handle 40, 50% drops in options position, not because I'm rolling in millions of dollars. I can because maybe I don't have that much money in that position. Maybe I'm well diversified. So if I'm well diversified, I'm not getting blasted in one position or another. Do you guys all understand that part? Because what a lot of you do, you don't have to tell me, you guys get too excited about one thing and you lump a lot of money in that particular position. And when that position, for no fault of your own, is going the other way, you're getting blasted. And when you're getting really blasted, you got to decide what you want to do. I very seldom, I very seldom have everything in one you know in one position actually i never do and i regret it sometimes because so many bad positions have gone up so big over the years over the months i wish i had a lot more in that position but i don't i like to take i'm very disciplined in that way so one of the key things i want all of you to understand because we're all in the same boat guys okay is the fact that you have to manage your trade management positions, your own way. If you are just stuck in two or three positions, have all your money in that stuff, you have no one to blame but yourself. And if you can't take the the larger a larger amount of money that you have in a particular, uh, um, I'm going to bring in my chart, uh, uh, in, in in a particular position, because you are in love with it, right? Um, then obviously uh, it's going to feel terrible. It's just going to feel terrible. It doesn't matter what that stock is going to be a week from now or three days from now. You're just going to feel like crap. And I felt like crap. For example, I've, I had a reasonably good position. I still do on the Russell 2000 because it looked fantastic. And that is the biggest beneficiary of any type of tax reform and any type of stuff that's happening on the U.S. economy. I'm very bullish on the Russell 2000. So the bottom line is I will have to decide how much pressure and loss I can endure on paper. Remember, a loss is never a loss unless you completely panic and sell out. I want you guys to fully understand that. All right? The actual trade management part, really, honestly speaking, is not my business. My business is to show you what's happening in front, put in my two cents what I think will happen. Your business is to decipher all that and go with it. If you think you can mimic my overall exact trading strategy, 
then first of all, I don't do that. Or secondly, why don't you pay me $10,000 a month so I can basically inform you on everything going on within my book every five minutes. If you're ready to do that, talk to me. But it's not going to wait. That's not the way it goes. This is a trading subscription service. It's not managing your trading book, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Just remember that. And I say that as, as friends, all right? Very, very important thing to realize. So Fish Eyes, for example, and I'm sure Tom and stuff, you know, who have, who have worked with me on ACS for years and years, um, you know, she shorted. I shorted around a buck fifty towards the end. The thing went to two thirty. I'm like, take some out. The thing went to six. Most I could get out of it was four. That was on that plunge. So you can do the same thing. Trent does that sometimes. And that's only if you you're you know you have the ability to watch on that side. So anyway, just want to make that clear. All right, let's take a look at some very important charts here and let's look at some extreme situations developing here guys we dropped almost 1100 points of the dow jones in one week not in a straight line we know that in hindsight yeah it looks like a straight line but in reality it doesn't because i just went through it there was lots of range movements and the big drop was obviously friday which looks like a smooth clean drop but i explained it wasn't when you do the crime scene analysis so saying all that um where do we stand we stand. Let's look at some basic things here. This is your daily on the on the S and P 500. The lower Bollinger is showing approximately 2734. 2734. Do the quick math. Quick. 2757. We close that. 2734. That's roughly 23 points. How much that in Dow points? Quick, somebody, please. Come on, come on, guys, please. 23 S&P points or 23 E-minis is roughly how much on the Dow Jones Industrial Average? 150. I'm sorry, what? Roughly about 140 points, okay? I always take the, I, I take the factor of six. Gentlemen, if you still don't have, and ladies, if you still don't have an immediate mental conversion, like one plus one equals two between S and P 500 E minis and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. With all due respect, and I am a nice guy. Please do not be a trader. With all due respect, do something, because this should be immediate. I should get immediate answers. Please, for God's sakes, we do serious work. Okay, this is my living. I don't take it lightly. I, my good. Uh, 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 projections, my positive projections, my negative projections makes me money, makes you guys money. I'm not in a different boat than you guys. But if you don't have basic, basic conversion metrics completely set in stone in your head, it just drives me crazy. Let's move on. So bottom line is we're we're talking about 140 points. We will most probably, and I'm going to show you another chart. We'll most probably open down 140 points tomorrow morning. Gentlemen, we will mo and I'm basing it on years of experience of what I have seen. I have gone through enough mini crashes, and we have come across on the other side with huge profits. Don't believe me? Ask people here. So this move here to the lower Bollinger is 140 Dow Jones points, ladies and gentlemen. Okay which should put in a tradable bottom short term, which could be one day, which could be six hours. It all depends on speed of the bounce or which could be two days, but it's going to be fast. I've always said, my good friend Tom knows that very well. The uglier the moves are, the more violent the reflex bounces are, and they're violent on the upside. This candle of 700 points, 700 points, like I said, and they mentioned it across the board on the media in the evening, that this was, we haven't even seen a 700 point drop before the Donald Trump election where the world was freaking out that we're all going to go to hell in a handbasket if Trump won. On one day, 700 points or 666, the devil's number, come on. 
It's almost laughable, but it's not laughable because I explained to you the reasons why these things are happening because of the bond market blowout. Bond traders got fried and that caused an avalanche of selling. Okay, fine. We're not here to judge. We're here to basically see what we can do. So the, the so this was a violent move. The violent move has two levels. One level is the lower Bollinger, 140 points, which the market might open at. Because, you know, this will have a ripple effect in Asian markets and stuff before they start stabilizing. We're going to find that out. Futures probably will open 10 in, in, uh, in it's 540 now, in 20 minutes time, before we even end this session. We'll see. So was that time to really get freaked out? I don't think so. I get nervous. I get scared. I get really excited, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, because these are the times you get the best frigging prices that you ever looked at. And these are the time the fewest participants ever buy. And the technical metrics that I'm going to go through over the next 20, 25 minutes are indicating extreme oversold. So an immediate, sharp, swift, powerful reflex bounce is imminent. At what time it starts, I don't know. And if it doesn't start, we're going to go completely in cash. I don't care what losses I have, you have, whatever. We're going to go completely in cash. We'll reevaluate. We'll decide. I might even do, if things get really, you know, if things are really different this time, I will do an immediate, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, Periscope broadcast tomorrow at any time during the day. All right. That's what we do here at Clueless Trading. We are always real time. We're always there. We don't run away. However, like I said, when you see me really panic, buy the crap out of the market. All right? Dead serious. So here is 140 points on the Dow. We'll probably get that. We'll probably, we might get that. What would be nice is we get that overnight. Just the way overnight, you know, you get that pullbacks. We get that overnight. We retest it. There is another level that I've marked here, which is on the E-minis is roughly around 2748. That's nothing. That's only, you know, that's nine points. This is 20 points, right? 2757 and down to 2733. Uh, so like about 24 points, which is roughly about 140 that points. Well, I don't want to keep on harping. If we fall, now we are in the channel here. We have a bunch of, bunch of supports. One is the lower Bollinger. And we have also a major support of this big, big monster breakout that ha occurred at the beginning of 2018 which a lot of you missed. You, if you look back at your life, you've missed more on the long side than you have lost on the short side by not being on the short side. Trust me, that's the case. So this was the big breakout and that comes into play at roughly 2,700. So we got two important numbers in top of our head. Either we go straight into to the 2700 level and test that big monster breakout of 2018. In other words, in simple English, we give back everything that was made. The market gives back everything that was made in 2018. Anything's possible. I'm just showing you the scenarios. And that drop will be roughly another 57 points. Let's call it 60 times 7 times 6 roughly. That's another 400 points. During points or uh, during uh, times of massive panic, 400 points, and we have seen this happen, guys. And some of you have never seen it happen. Well, listen carefully. 400 point drops in the market in, the, in, in 10, 15, 20 minutes have occurred during flash crashes. And those levels have to be bought hard. I don't care whether for 15 minutes, whether for 20 minutes, whatever. So, whatever you do tomorrow, if you're not being able to keep an eye on things and not being able to keep an eye on my real time feed, and I'm not going to be a robot putting out like five minute, like, you know, monkey on a hot tin roof post, I will do my due diligence and I'll put it the right thing, what I think is important, long or short. But if you don't have to do that, just don't trade. Just don't do anything. Just let it go. Move away. Go have a nice cup of coffee. Walk your dog. Pet your cat. Sing to your bird. I don't know. 
Just don't do anything. So this would be a, a full, full re retracement. Full retracement. Also, that is your big, big, beautiful August. Remember, I talked about August. By the way, before I go any further, I requested people, and I shouldn't be able to request. You should do this on your own if you care about your money. I put some very powerful end of the day charts on Friday. I was exhausted. I didn't need to do that. I did it for all of you guys, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, I put some very important with some important comments. Hopefully, you guys saw it. Hopefully, you guys looked at it. Seriously. And I'm going to show you a couple of them. I'm going to walk you through them because these are extreme levels. The technical levels that we saw uh, on, on, on Friday were similar to the technical levels, technical levels on the market, not absolute market levels. Try to understand what I'm saying. Technical levels in the market seen in August. And August was a very, very, you know, they had some big ugly candles and then big hammer movements lots of volatility let's just put it this way the technical levels reached on friday were similar to august of 2016. whoa i'm sorry august of 2017. that's unheard of and at that time the s p 500 or the or the es was at 2400. So that's a major positive divergence. Internals reached the lowest points while we are at 26, 2757. At the same, uh, internals hit the same levels on the lower end as to what we reached in August when we were at 2400. That's known as what? That's known as what? When you at a much higher level reach the same extreme internal so oversold readings as when you were at 2400 what's that term known as come on guys positive divergence thank you very much who's who, who said that jody yeah common sense jody right but that's what we all lack thank you jody it's known as positive divergence a major positive divergence and if you guys understand, I'll say it once more. We are at 2,400 on the S&P 500, give or take. I'm not doing the conversion of five points, all right? And the internal readings, which I'm going to show you on the charts. Charts don't lie. We can freak out. You know, we can lie to ourselves. We can lie to everybody else, you know. Charts don't lie. Technicals never lie. Internals don't lie. We reached the same technical deep, deep, extreme oversold levels as August when we were at 2,400. But now we are 2,700. That's known, thank you, Jody, as a positive divergence. Positive divergence always plays out. It is not a guarantee that it's going to keep on playing out, but it is going to play out. And that's why I'm saying I've always seen this because I've gone through how many crashes and learned from each one of them. And each one of them, I know this one was very rapid. So I explained all that earlier on. So positive divergence um, on, 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 on the front. A positive divergence of almost 300 points, 2,400, 2,700, same levels. So this chart is very clear. Just, you know, lower end of the scale is around 2,700. That's the very nice uptrending channel that we're trading in. <laughs> it wasn't nice because many of you were freaking out big time every time that the markets were down just a few points. And I kept on saying trend is intact. Uptrend is intact. Uptrend is intact. No, you know, some of you don't believe me. Most of, I don't, what do I care? Okay, this was moving in a range. And then we broke out like a monster 2018, which most traders out there, and I'm, I'm sure some of some traders you know, in here too, completely missed out. Monster move. And the retracement, which I did talk about and warn. Let's move on. This is look, my business on the on the free webinars and stuff is not to keep on saying, Oh, I told you all that. Um, my business is basically to say, listen, you gotta consider all probabilities of what's going on. That's my job. So now we are going to look at a couple of charts that were already created, and I am going to bring them out from the other side, right? So on the Twitter feed, and if you're not 
uh, bothering to look at the end of the charts because you're just so emotionally, you know, exhausted. That's fine. Why don't you look at it on Saturday morning over a cup of coffee? Because those say a lot. So I'm just going to start bringing them out. One second. I'm human too, man. It gets really exhausting. So for me to do this session on Super Bowl Sunday, respect it, guys. All right? Because I don't need to do that. I could write a, five, a, a 10 line uh, blog newsletter saying, careful, markets in dangerous territory. See you guys all later. You know, no, I don't do that. I put in my heart and soul in what I do. And I'm showing you stuff that is hardcore. Respect it. It'll help you. And I don't really care because I do care, but I don't really care if you don't want to help yourself. And, I, and I'm just being as straightforward as possible. Because I had a lot of family stuff to do. And I took a quick short nap. And believe me, I didn't want to get up and do this. So let's do this, guys. All right? Let's make it happen. Um, number one, we already covered this, right? So we know what these levels are. Oh, I forgot to show this part. So you look at the, there's some stupid digital ad coming through. So we have to cut out the sound. Uh, so look at uh, look at the look at the internals. You can see the internals here, and the internals are just a complete nosedive. It is actually below August. Just the simple stochastics. The fast stochastics are at minus 12. Hallelujah. Minus 12. As I've explained to many in ACS, and Tom will remember that very well, when you get down to these levels, you hold your nose, you close your eyes, and you buy the crap out of whatever's coming your way at cheaper prices. Minus 12. Great. That's pure capitulation. That's on the S&P futures daily. These are the daily charts I'm showing you. These were all posted on Friday. And I really was exhausted. And I did that so people could just... Take a look at them. So on the Russell 2000, the chart is more complex. It is a complete pattern. Boom. And the Russell 2000 closed beautifully on Thursday afternoon. I'll tell you that. So the calls which originally were bought at around 11 or so, because they were in the money, right? So they were the more expensive. I kept on buying them all the way down to about four. Because I don't lump in all at one time. I said that. So if you bought one there, you could buy three at four. Or two more calls at four. Bring your cause down. Unless you truly believe the United States of America is going to hell in a handbasket. In which case, I can't help you. Because it always feels like that whenever we have a pullback, right? It's never going to end. Okay. So this is a full pattern. Uh, uh, it's a loop in between lots of you know we've done very well in between we have caught the big moves we have caught uh, 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 some of the smaller moves so at this point there was a gap here which was around 154 I I, I, I average cost down here there was right at that gap if you notice uh, there was a uh, uh, there, there was the, a green candle Remember, this is not one hour and stuff. This is yeah, this is the one hour chart. So you can see a little bit more clearly. Uh, it started to go back into the gap and then that last day, you know, last hour of selling. So what am I supposed to do? Just so you know, my style is I I can I can handle mental risk because I understand the mechanics of the market and I have more experience. So I can't tell you what your mental risk tolerance level is. So if you want to panic and sell out here, I'm not gonna say you're wrong or right. Do what you need to do. I don't. I grit my teeth and I will be cost averaging down here. I did it. Am I going to be dead right? Most of the times I've been of these type of calamitous waterfall declines. They're known as waterfall declines, these type of declines. Um, but that's me. I can't change you and your, and, and your risk tolerance. I'm not going to go out there, just so you all know, and say, sell, get out. I'm not going to do it. If I, see a, a, if I see a true major break in the market and it's just like, you know, oh, yes, I will. And I've explained those scenarios in my video cast. So it's up to you to decide what you want to do. If you truly believe we're going into a bear market, fine. 
That's your prerogative, not mine. I don't believe that. I believe this is a corrective phase. I'm not saying I'm going to make new highs. I'm saying I'm going to have powerful reflex bounces. And as a trader, that's money in the pocket. So just so I'm clear about what I'm saying. All right, that's it. So this was this was uh, also uh, a minor positive divergence here because when the Russell was at around, I mean, sorry, the IWM was around 154 or the Russell was around 1545 or whatever it is, um, you actually created the bottom. And as we went lower, the actual stochastics were actually higher. That's a positive divergence. Whichever the case, look at the pattern symmetry. The last time we were here was around the 5th of, um, uh, was on the 5th of what month? Of January? Yes, 5th of January, right there, which was a screaming buy. I'm focusing on that. Which was a screaming buy. Because if, if you had caught and we had alerted that move at the beginning of January, You would have, you would have, basically, and you know we caught, we have alerted, and some of you did it, it phenomenal. You'd have made about six, seven, eight hundred thousand, twelve hundred percent on your money. So are we at that same level? And I, do I think a similar thing can happen? I don't care if a similar thing happens because these are humongous lottery tickets. I just want to pull up. Up towards this level, that's why there's a big fat red arrow here. Not that hard to understand, guys, right? And that itself is good for 30 points on the Russell, on the RUT. Good enough for me. And I'll be looking along the way how the reaction of those of the movements are, and the charts are put in place so you can basically replicate this on your side. I'm not supposed to be putting out five, six minute charts in a heavily volatile market. I put out the charts, you replicate it on your side, so you can take a quick look at it. Dynamic charts are changing every 15, 20, 30, 45 minutes, especially in volatile markets. What am I supposed to do? Put it out every five minutes? So wake up to some reality. I'm not saying all of you, but some of you are in some la-la land about how this, uh, how this business works. All right? So I'll be putting out some very, I, I put out substantial real-time charts. But you have to replicate it on your side so you can quickly look at it and see where it is. So the Russell 2000 is full pattern uh, uh, um, completion from the, on this end. Is it a screaming buying opportunity? We don't know yet. We'll find out. It could be it could be a screaming buying opportunity. It goes up above the gap. If it does exactly what it did on January 5th, it'll go up. Uh, you will get roughly about 20 points on the Russell 2000, which is a very phenomenal uh, ROI. Uh, probably 150 to 200 percent, uh, and then um, immediate sell off. So if it doesn't, so it goes over the gap and pulls back. It tries to create. If it creates a higher low, if it creates a higher low, and this all happens within a matter of two days. All right, two or three days. If it creates a higher low, big buyers come in. The most aggressive buyers come in here. The secondary buyers will, uh, the, 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 the ones who, uh, the, the chasers come in around here and they get slapped like whack-a-mole. You know what whack-a-mole is? Your kids ever have one? Whack-a-mole? That's it, okay? The lemmings come in here. We'll be sellers at this gap fill or most of it. We'll see the reaction here. It could either jettison forward and fill this gap, in which case I'd be selling all and then re-entering. Oh, of course, I'll be selling all because by that time, I'll be rolling out to some higher strikes. Obviously, if you buy a, 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 a IWM at, with the 153 or 154 and it goes up to 157, what do you do? Oh, I'm not going to sell. Of course, you're going to sell. Sell, take your profits and then buy the sell the 154s and then buy the 157 and the 158. Isn't that common sense? You keep most of your profits and you shift out to lower premium call options on a higher strike. Do the same thing with stocks. Does everyone understand that part? Because that's a very simple way of doing things. And I know a lot of you do it, but is, every, is it clear to everybody? Please? Yes. Thanks. Yes. Okay, good. Common sense stuff. Yeah. So, so that's it. All right, let's go to before. We don't want to miss the, the real big game coming up. All right, so there's your Russell 2000, NASDAQ. Oh, hallelujah. Okay, that's primarily Apple. 
and Google. So NASDAQ had a humongous breakout again uh, in um, 2018, right? So this, 2000, this was a humongous breakout, 2018. So this is uh, basically giving back, and I'll put this out tomorrow, possibly about 50% Fibonacci retracement, that standard procedure. And what they did to Apple was completely manipulative. I mean, completely legal, if you ask me. To run a stock up six bucks after hours and then hit it back, hit it down seven bucks the day after, what, things just changed rapidly? Look, I'm not, I always say, let's not be big time analysts or analysts, whatever you want to call it, right? I was never that gung ho about Apple. I bought the lottos. But Apple had strong numbers. They had lesser iPhone sales, which is standard in between the cycles of a newer iPhone coming out. But their service numbers were huge. And their ASPs or average selling prices on their on their iPhone 10s and iPhone 8s shot up. So by selling lesser iPhones, they're making more money because they're selling at a higher ASP or average selling price. Their services side of the business, which is they have matched number of their uh, uh, Apple, uh, uh, what do you call it, apps and services. Like I have Apple iCloud. I pay $2.99, $2.99 a month, you know, for huge storage, right? So bottom line is that's going through the roof. And the number of people using it is the same as Facebook. I mean, it's mind-boggling. And Apple's growth is finished. It's almost laughable. What can I say? Multiple price targets were raised. Didn't matter. Technical flow, the sentiment in the market, all that stuff, boom. And now the bears are crawling out. Fine. The bears were crawling out of Apple when the, when the stock was at uh, $100. Okay. I give up. So bottom line is, these are the levels I'm looking at. Megaphone, and I just showed it. Now, wrote, remember, we don't trade NASDAQ 100 futures. But it gives you an idea of, you know, what's happening in the background. So same thing, lower Bollinger, deep, deep oversold. This is a daily. Goes back all the way to 2017. Even during this move here in 2017, this was the, uh, this was the last two weeks in 2017 when the NASDAQ was selling off like crazy. Okay? Moving up and then selling off by the downtrend. It's a very defined channel. And then de 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 December 29th, if you guys remember, we had a big, big, ugly day, which was a great buying opportunity. We actually didn't even break 20 on the RSI, on the stochastics. We broke 20. We're at minus 7. We're at minus 7. No, we're at, oh, I'm sorry. We're at 7.38. Hallelujah. I give up. I mean, that's heavy duty oversold. That's the bond guys basically just slicing off whatever stocks they have and apple's own across the board right and just getting out of dodge like oh my god these margin sellouts are going to kill me that's that's really the reason no other reason i can think of and i've seen i've been you know around the block on these things um okay would you think a lot of mutual funds and stuff who want apple just said that's it we don't like apple anymore tim cook is an idiot you know that's it no they didn't Apple's going to do a massive buyback. They were, they were saying Apple by March is going to do 10 to 20% buyback of their stock. Do you know what that means? 10 to 20% buyback of their stock? Holy cow. Stock will go up like 50 points just on that buyback. So all these value fund managers who love Apple and the yield, I mean, they're, they're in, you know, yeah, they're yield on their, on their common uh, dividends that they pay and stuff. And they're going to hike their dividends too. Not to mention the growth that's already in place. So they're hiking the dividends. They're going to do a huge buyback. And you think all these big shots who own the real holders of Apple just said, okay, see you later. We're buying. Because one analyst said, or two analysts said, oh, you know, it's going to be, you know, it, it's, it, it looks like their growth cycle's over. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. That's okay. SPY. Now, this is the, this is the important part here. This is the SPY. This is your quad, algo, you know, the Algo HFT platform. We are approaching, this is the daily. Every time algo, uh, uh, the Algo HFT platform quad, it's going to say bar chart because they use bar charts as their function. 
as their as their chart charting platform, and then they put their own data in, right? So bar chart provides the data too. So we are approaching right now the 34, the upwardly rising. The key word is upwardly rising. 34 day moving average, the orange line. We'll see this on the think or swim too. The 50 day moving average here on the spies is approximately, you know, it, that's why I put these two arrows. I mean, what more can I do? Now, on the daily, we have not, I repeat, on the spies at least, it's showing we have not reached full, maximum deep oversold. Maybe that's why the retest of the 50 day moving average is likely. Before that, you're going to see a quick bounce. And in my opinion, that bounce will need to be sold. And that bounce will cause a breakage of the 34 moving average and, call, and create a massive buying opportunities at the lower end of the channel. This upwardly rising channel going back to August of 2017. You can see that it's very clear. You don't need to like scratch your head and say, what am I looking at? And that will be at the 50 day moving average right there, the red line and the lower Bollinger. I highly encourage everyone to use quad. I highly encourage anyone who's serious about trading to use quad. Because whatever charts you're looking at and stuff, you're not reading it right. You're not reading my charts right. And a lot of a lot of you guys, even some of the active traders, not reading my charts right. And the ones who are doing, they are reacting and managing their trade positions better than anybody who is not. And don't give me a, a whole line of excuses. I work really full time and this and that. It takes one second to look at something. Please. So you care about your money, use these platforms. And if you have time, then uh, more time in your hands, will definitely use these platforms. Okay, so this is clear as day, okay? This is not fully sold off yet completely. The, the fast stochastics, remember the STOC is the fast one, the 93 number. That is fully deep oversold levels. The last time it was this oversold was back on, uh, back on uh, um, again, beginning of January, right there. And look what happened. See you later, which a good bunch of you missed. So this is technically at that see you later stage on the fast stochastic. So if this does this, then we're going to see a very sharp bounce. Will it take us back to the highs? Honestly? With the technical damage done, I don't think so yet. I just think it's going to go back to the pivot, which is marked in this yellow line here, which is around 281, 282. That's a lot of money. You've got to be a technical trader. There's a gap here. You can see that. There's a gap here. And if you use bar charts, you'll see that there's a gap here. So, and if this keeps on, you know, remember the fast stochastics move rapidly. They can get overbought within a one day. The slow stochastics are the ones which require a bunch of days. Some cases, if it's a big move in the market, like two, three, four hundred points on the upside, then they get overbought very quickly. Anyway, that's my job to interpret and show you. Your job is to is is to look at it and understand what I'm saying and the few comments that I'm making. But a big barrel here because I think the 34 is going to hold. Unless every tech company coming out, NVIDIA is coming out this week and stuff, are all going to say, oh, we just lost our growth mojo. We're all like a bunch of idiots. We don't know what we're doing. You know what I'm saying? So if that's the case, then the 34 will be gone. Let's move on. All these have been posted on Friday, ladies and gentlemen. IWM. God, I love it. If you're a bargain hunter, you are in a very sweet position. See, futures open down 15 right now. So I am looking at futures open down 15. We are already there. While we go through this, I just looked at my other screen. This is what I want to see. I want to see futures open down and find those levels. We're going to look at the E-minis in a second. I just looked at my other screen. Futures down 16. That's the first reaction. You do not want the first reaction to be up. They'll slam it big time down, just so you know. All right? That's the way it works. So the IWM on the on the quad chart is telling. It is almost there on the daily. Slow stochastics are blasted low. We are the lower Bollinger. We are slightly below the 50-day moving average. 
And if somebody tells me that they are going to see another candle of this magnitude within the next day, well, that is a like a, a citing the, the white, uh, uh, whatever, the blue moon and the orange moon and the red moon altogether. How about that? It doesn't work like that. If the downtrend is going to continue, it will first bounce, then fall. Because that's just the way it goes. So this is also very clear as day. That's why the marker is here. And this, like it a lot. Because the last time it came down here was right there. See why I put those markers? And this takes time, guys. The markers are related to the internals. When the internals get to these levels, look what happens. Huge money is made. Internals got down to the level where we are right now. Big bounces happen. It's, it's there. Now, will it be like this? Yeah, it's possible. So if it slips down lower, if it slips down lower, you want to be a big buyer here. In the meantime, you might want to get out or you might want to average cost down. I can't tell you to do that. That's like I said, risk management is your business. Get out if you want. Sit in cash. Wait for that perfect moment. But remember, the perfect moment is the ugliest moment. The perfect moment is the ugliest moment. Perfect moments are not when you're happy. Same thing in life and in trading. You don't believe me? Look at the market. The perfect prices are when it's the ugliest. Technically speaking, the ugliest. And that's the level we're in right now. I, I can't teach that to people. You know, that's, that's, I gave up on that long time ago. Okay. Uh, VIX is at a crucial level. The last time we were at the VIX, this was the other chart that I showed on Friday. The last time we were at the VIX up here was in April or August, August. Okay. August right now. And this is where we are right now. Can it overshoot? Sure. Now the thing you got to keep in mind, this cloud cover is known as the Bollinger, right? Obvious. It's the Bollinger band. When you get this much of an overshoot on the Bollinger, that means things are really like out of control on the overbought side. Nothing stays out of the Bollinger for more than one or two days. Nothing. Whether on the, if this is a Bollinger crowd and you got a stock price which falls completely below the Bollinger, you will get an immediate, and the immediate doesn't mean like in five minutes, some sort of bounce trying to get back in the Bollinger, which can be rejected as the Bollinger turns down. If you overshoot out of the Bollinger and you're like in that la-la land, like everything's going to the moon and stuff, I've warned people about this for weeks now, I'll tell you that. All right? I will stand by it. Don't believe me? Listen to my webinars and my video cast that's out there. So bottom line is that it's going to the moon and stuff out of the Bollinger, it will pull towards back to the Bollinger. That's just the way it goes. So when you see the VIX, the Bollinger is here, and it's all the way up here, show me one instance, one instance on the history of the VIX, going back to 2015, when the VIX spiked to 54 at one point, where it stayed above the Bollinger for more than, and this is a weekly chart, for more than one week. Every single time there's a Bollinger overshoot of this magnitude, it has pulled back inside the Bollinger. And if it, when it pulls back, it's and this is a weekly, so it's a little bit more, you know, uh, it shows uh, the, the, cuts out a lot of the noise. You get massive reflex bounces. So don't expect things in 5 or 10, 15 minutes. But when it comes, it was, it's coming. It will pull back inside the Bollinger. End of story. Let's move on. This is a very telling chart. I've said this to, and Tom, my good friend, and a couple of people who have taken ACS for a while now. No. I've always said, when you see the, when you, oh, this is not the NIMO. Okay, this is the, I'd let me go to the, let me go through this. This is this is your swing five three three. It's plunging every time you plunge down towards you. Look at the structure. Forget the numbers. 
The numbers are not what we're looking at. We're not going to 2475 yet. So bottom line is that when the when the when the uh, uh, stochastics go down towards these levels, you start to get a turn. Now that that turn has to somebody please cut out the noise, please. I know somebody's probably fighting with their headphones or something. Um, save that energy for tomorrow. Just kidding. But uh, bottom line is you see the you see the MACD plunge to minus eight. Unheard of. August when we plunged. Even before the elections, November of oh well, this was August of 2017. When we plunged, the the MACD only went to minus five. And look at it just visually. Forget the numbers. We're at minus seven and a half. Minus seven and a half. Look, I'm like a surgeon who deciphers things and tries to figure out what's going on. I haven't seen these type of readings. Either we're going to complete hell. And we are starting a bear market. Highly, highly doubt that. You do not go into a bear market with rates even moving higher, moving to a 3%. You go to a bear market if rates are shooting to 6% and nobody can afford a mortgage anymore and the housing market collapses. Okay? Because if 10 year goes to 6%, mortgage rates are going to be 9 to 10%. And you know what that means, right? That means that's it. Because the housing market is the biggest pillar of the U.S. economy. You don't go into a recession with corporate earnings, 72% of companies are on the S&P 500 beating earnings and projecting strong guidance. You don't go into a recession with extremely business-friendly business administration, I mean, uh, uh, president, uh, uh, president and his administration. So I'm just kind of laying out the theory, all right? So this is unheard of right here. Can we slip a little bit more? We are. We are there. We were down 22. I'm watching the futures on my other end. We're down 22. Now we're down 18. You're going to see that monkey on a hot tin roof dance all night. And we're going to look at the ES as the final chart. So, uh, so bottom line is, oh, and then the RSI at less than 10. Every single, why do I put these arrows there? Just to make the chart more appealing? No, because there's a significance to it. Because every time you get down towards this level, you start to see beginnings of a turn on the stochastics. OK, and we're, th we're there. And when these stores turn, you want to buy with all hands down and just sit tight. You can do some, you know, whatever. That's a figure of speech. That's your SP SPX swing 532. You want to learn a lot more about it? Sign up for the ACS. I'll give you the whole mechanics of what it is. Now, this is stunning. I was like, whoa, I haven't seen anything like this in a while. OK, uh, let me try to get this screen bigger. Okay, I guess that's as big as it gets. Okay, somebody's playing bad elevator music or starting to cry. So please, can you just uh, mute yourself on the other end? Bad elevator music is fine. If you start to cry, just put your head under a pillow, all right? Um, so, um, or grab some diapers, as we like to say in the business. So here's the point. New York Stock Exchange, McLaren Oscillator. Want to understand it? Did anyone see the article that I posted out there? If you hadn't had a chance to read it, read it before bedtime. End of story. Tom McClellan put the same thing that I put out on Friday night. And Tom McClellan and his father is the originator of the New York of the McClellan Oscillator. Very, very smart people. And I highlighted this on Friday after six because that it was it, all the numbers were updated that time. What is telling you? And I've said this, and Tom, you remember? Any oh, yes. This is unbelievable, guys. I don't know what to say. This ain't no reality show. This is not the frigging apprentice. And by the way, you know, I love what Donald and his team are doing and stuff. I hated the apprentice. That was one of the dumbest shows in the world that I've ever seen. I, do people actually follow the I'm sure they did, right? I mean, they were a bunch of idiots, all dressed well, running around New York. You know, people don't do that in New York, in New York City, running around asking vendors what they're doing. It was the, one of the dumbest shows I've ever seen. I saw two shows. I said, this is it's so stupid. Shark Tank, different story. But it was the dumbest show. Uh, but there's enough people out there who loved it. I swear to God, I'm not saying this, you know, this is not a personal thing. <laughs> so this ain't no reality show, guys. This is clue to say trading straight on. All right? At your face. So bottom line is that you get these readings. This was back in 2015. This was Brexit June of 2016. I didn't even mark that one. 
What was the 2015 massive thing? I think it was a rate tantrum. Minus 104, minus 92, minus 67 during Brexit, right before the elections, minus 75, 2016, minus 90. I've said this and Tom will validate that. And he knows I've been right almost every, actually every single time when we are seeing these numbers, Tom. And you know, I don't make this up. Tom is one of the straightest straight shooters you'll ever meet. Okay, swimming the market, Mr. Gans here. He's not a prop because I don't like, I don't believe in props. I what, what do I always say, Tom? You buy with your hands down, right? <laughs> Yes, it's uh, not easy the first time, but it, it does get a little it, bit easier after you do it a few times. It is not easy, and it's not perfect. But I have never – this is like minus 104 is like – you're almost guaranteed. Like I've always said, there are no guarantees in this business. There's only probabilities of making money. But when you see the New York McClellan oscillator – and read his goddamn article that I put out there for your benefit, all of your benefit, please. Don't waste your time on my service if you don't want to self-educate yourself to run, make your own money. Seriously. I don't, you know, I don't mince words. I'm telling you the truth. I want you guys to be self-independent, use my tools, and do great. Okay. Bottom line is minus 90? Whoa. Even if we slip a little bit more, that means we are going to get one heck of a huge reflex bounce. I don't know. I didn't say like we're going to go to the highs and stuff. I showed you the levels on my charts, like where we can bounce up. You know, we dropped a thousand points. Simple rule of the thumb. We get a move, a, a bounce, which will be slapped down hard of 300 to 400 points, uh, 300 to 500 points. Why is that? Somebody step up and say, what's 50% retracement? That's a Fibonacci retracement. And we're going to look at that as the final chart. So, guys, just real simple English. You get these horrific numbers on the McClellan oscillator. And please read his article, what he wrote about the VIX futures. And 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 and, and, and here, right there. I I, I paraphrase, not paraphrase. I copied the last portion of his paragraph. And you can read the whole article because I don't like change things around to make it look good. He said the third highest. This is my words, okay? During pre-presidential election, November 2000, pullback highest oversold reading was seven. Suggest me say, oh, oh, that was my writing on Friday, and then I'll show you what he wrote over the weekend. And I was like, wow. All I'm saying simply in simple English, guys. If you get 90, 100 things, that means things on certain fronts are so cheap. It is literally a 80 to 90 percent probability, unless. We are truly going into a massive depression. I refuse to buy that because everything that I see, and I understand economics better than most people out there. Okay, maybe some of you are, you know, better understanding macroeconomics. Let's have a drink and let's talk about it, right? Uh, but the bottom line is that it's unbelievable. It is truly dramatic. What is simple English? Contrarian buy signal. So these are just articles I put across. Now this is what I this is the chart I put to show and I wrote in simple English during pre-presidential election November 2000 pullback highest oversold reading was 75 and we're 90. Now some people might say hey the bond market's a lot bit bigger so not really the bond market is actually smaller than that because our you know we are we are being basically cutting back on bond purchases we don't do any bond purchases or we do but we just you know we're reducing the balance sheet. The, 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 the monetary balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. In other words, we're not building our debt, bring it down a little bit. So all this garbage stuff, you know, after the market, the devil's in the quarter point detail, all this stuff. These are huge numbers. When you see headlines like this, most retail traders, they're like, that's it, it's over. One trillion in one week? On strong economic growth and earnings and fear that wages are going nuts, which they are not? Ask your local McDonald's guy. Hey, your wages went up 10 bucks, man. You buying that Ferrari? Yeah, great. Don't give me that garbage. doesn't matter what the politicians say. Yes, wage pressure is higher, which is a big component of inflation. So inflation is ticking higher. It's fine, but they're not going overboard. Um, this is a great study. 
and read this stuff. Not because you're trying to educate yourself. It's because you make more money this way. What really happens? Statistical happening. So what happens when the Dow plunges more than 500 points? Ken Sho does statistical research. They don't do emotional research. Read it. That's why I put it up there. And this is the one that I am talking about. Tom McClellan, read immediately. I don't care where you read it. You're sitting on the on in 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 the bathroom or you know whatever you're doing. Sit there. That's actually the best place to read. <laughs> um, okay, no offense meant to anybody. That is a fantastic place to read. Okay, so bottom line is that it it, it, it read. S and P's and this is his words, not mine. When S and P 500 is in an uptrend like what we are in right now, these instances nearly always. Tom McClellan doesn't speak like this. He's a very conservative guy. You've seen him on CNBC or Google him to see what he looks like. He doesn't look like a New York City party boy or a hedge fund manager talking garbage. He's a very conservative Midwestern gentleman. These instances nearly always mark nice short-term bottoms for stock prices. Then I put review all Friday, end of the day, published on the real-time Twitter feed. And this is your article. Read it. You don't have to understand everything he says, but he likes to put it. He just, it's just three paragraphs. I read it on my iPhone. I thought it was longer. Okay. During scary declines, things get out of whack, and the VIX index can rise up above the level of some or all of it. The VIX is above its futures contracts. That's like euphoria gone wild on the VIX side. <laughs> VIX never goes up above its contract price, its forward contract price. And he talks about this there. When I read this, this validates what I do how I educate my members, how I educate myself, how I educate my traders. So despite all the emotional hurt that we go through on certain days and all the joy and euphoria that a lot of you miss because you never placed yourself at the cheaper prices, I get validated, I get vindicated, and I feel good that things that I'm thinking, I'm thinking in the right direction. And when Tom McClellan, one of the most respected gentlemen, and he's not some Wall Street bozo, he created an index that is used by every single institution out there. The McClellan Oscillator is writing this, and I put that down on Friday? Well, I got to feel a little bit good. And you guys should are privileged to get this information and being explained the way I'm explaining it. End of story. So this is what it says. During scary declines, things get out of whack and the VIX index can rise above the level of its futures contract. This week's chart shows those instances. They're pretty rare. In a corrective period, well, I just wrote it, when the S&P 500 is up, we are, these instances always mark short-term nice bottom. From his words, you know, to God's ears. Bottom line is technically what we're getting at. We're, we're there. All right, let's move on. Uh, so that's what I put out there, and next was the link. So please look through that stuff, especially the McLaren Loss later thing. Three paragraphs will make, fundamentally change the way you look at things. So uh, what is the other one? Here's what's going on. Hallelujah. This is real life. We are right now. This is a weekly chart. We are going into the daily. Let's go in the one hour. So we are, I had posted this uh, for you guys on um, so what I would really like to see to be honest with you and Tom fill in the words what would we like to see overnight while we uh, while we are sleeping those few hours that we get to sleep what... uh, go all the way down to the 50 would be really nice thank you very much God bless you man I don't know what to do with that Tom exactly we want to see ugliness reign during the Super Bowl, by the way, this is a very rare occurrence that the market sold off like that. These bond guys are like really like frigging losing it. We never sell off before Super Bowl like that. Seriously, this is a rare occurrence. And I'll take that rarity and turn it into green money. I'm dead serious. This is very rare. That before Super Bowl sold off like that. But hey. Technicals over seasonals, right? Technicals over football. So what we would like to see as my esteemed friend and member, as he goes by the name, Swimming the Market. I love that. 
Okay. We would like to see a retest of the 50-day moving average. We would like to see that 50-day moving average retest overnight and maybe at the open and freak the heck out of everybody. So let's do a simple math because that's what we do, simple math. Not like my son who does advanced calc and quantitative whatever he does. Just got accepted to the financial engineering program. God bless him. I do simple numbers and percentages. I almost failed in calculus in college. Not that, uh, you know. And then I caught up with it and I, go, I got an A. And the guy's like, my professor's like, what happened? I said, uh, I got smarter, sir. And I never took that class again. Okay. <laughs> so there you go. So bottom line is, uh, let's do the math. Um, the low right now printed, this is a very powerful session. I'm very happy you guys are here. And I, and I know you guys are getting everything I'm saying. So right now, we basically will put a line here, real-time stuff, right? And that was, we'll mark it, and I'm not going to change this chart, right? So we'll look at it tomorrow. Uh, because we will probably do a session later on tomorrow to evaluate what the heck's going on. So we, I'm going to put the price on the left, 27.32. Where are we on with uh, the 50-day moving average? Remember, the lines are still trending higher despite this massive drawdown. Do you see any curvature of the lines on the daily towards the right hand, like curving down on the, on, on, on the, on the right side? Are you starting to see that? Yeah, the five-day moving average, which is obviously you know, what happens during the week. That's understandable. Is the 20 crashing? I want a yes or no. Is the 20-day 20 uh, 20 moving average, the blue line, have, did you guys notice any type of sharp move down? Yes or no, please. No. Yes or no? No. Okay. And this is despite 1,100 point drop on the Dow. The, the, the orange line, which is the 34-day moving average, these are extremely powerful lines. Do you, are you starting to see, let me try to pull it up here. Are you starting to see it curving down? Yes or no, somebody, please. Trent said no. Okay. Somebody says yes, I'd no. like, you know, uh, uh, I would like to, you know, if, they, if we keep on going down, believe me, they're going to start curving down. So we're going to be watching this very carefully. No, nothing has happened yet so far. This is flattening. Instead of rising, it's flattening. Understood. 50-day moving average, still rising. So the move from 27.35 to 27.19, I'm just rounding off the numbers, is how many points, guys? 16. Uh, 13 points. Oh, no, I'm sorry. My apologies. 16. Slap myself. 16. So, 16. Thank you so much. So let's multiply 16 by 6 or 7. That's roughly 100, 96. 196. So let's call it 100 points. That's good. Everyone agree? So what did I say earlier on to you guys? See, this is the magic of technical analysis. I said we, would, we can drop at the open 140 points or so, correct? Yes. Thank you. And right now, we can see that if we test the 50-day moving average, we'll open down 100 points, which you shall embrace. You should embrace. But when something opens down 100 points, it doesn't just immediately bounce off that. It can slip a little bit, right? It can slip. So that slippage could be 140 points at the open. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Right. Now, if things go really haywire, and we'll... But definitely go, you know, put out some quick shorts. You know, whatever short you're doing, you got to be quick because it's going to be fast. Is we are looking at 2700, which was the big, bad, beautiful breakout that was very ugly for the shorts back in January of 2018. So if we're going to drop from here to 2700, that's roughly 38 points. Let's call it 40 points. Okay, just round it off. 40 points times six. So that's another. So this is 140 points here. And down here, it will be another 240 points to test this big bad breakout that happened. But generally speaking, you see big movement and buyers and shorts covering at around the 50-day moving average. As long as the 50-day moving average is 
trending higher, which it is. We all agree on that. Now, the bounce off that is not going to take us to the moon. You're going to find heavy resistance, heavy resistance at around the 20-week moving average and the downward sloping yellow line. And you guys all use a platform. You can just add these lines, which is the five-day five -day moving average. Now, let's look to see what's happening underneath the surface. Oh, Lord. Now, this is your trader's version, right? This is your one-hour charts. One-hour charts, deep, 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 deep oversold. And uh, every time we get down there, we get a quick, sharp bounce. This is the one-hour chart. This is your trader's friend. So those levels have been put in place. Well, those are the same levels as, as what it is. Uh, let's take a look at the daily and see when was the last time we were down here the last time we were down here like i said before was august of 2017 the big bad drop right there there's candles with this huge drop and way higher that's the positive divergence we talked about before we are below that we are at 13 right now on a real-time basis like wow does that mean the sell-off is immediately finished? No. I believe the sell-off finishes, as I just clearly explained, and I want to keep on repeating, at the 50-day, possibly a slippage down to 2,700. At this point, these candles are heavy. It, it, I, you know, the 50-day should come into contact between now and you know through the night. Maybe if the Patriots get blasted, the 50 day is engaged right away. How about that? All right. And uh, or, or or the Eagles have an upset win. They should win. They're the underdogs, right? So who knows? Whatever the case, you saw the picture. So this is where we are, guys. So that's all I got to say. It's 636. I'm really happy that all of you guys can make it tonight. Um, there's really not much to say. This is a technical sell-off of monumental proportions. The good news is that it's happening fast. It's happening, boom, just like that, like within hours. That's my fist, you know, use the noise, use the sound effects, guys, look. Boom, right? It's it's punching us in the face on a certain positions, but in between, there are winning positions. And I'm expecting one of my biotechs or two of my biotechs to be bought out. This is my gut feeling. Remember, optimism sometimes, unbridled optimism on certain fronts. I'm very optimistic about uh, uh, M&A in the biotech sector. Just got to be positioned, have some small positions across the board. That small gets very big. If you lump into one or two of these biotechs that I keep on mentioning, I, I keep on mentioning six or seven or maybe more, have a little bit, of, bit in each. Treat them as a basket. If you lump in too much in one, that doesn't go and that goes down. Well, don't, don't you know, don't sit there crying. Um, any quick questions I'll answer because I got to wrap up right now. Yeah, Frank, quick question on Apple. Yeah. With the you know, increase in dividends we know coming and the, the buybacks coming soon, would you look for like a swing in a, a with the options maybe going out to like you know, okay. late March, April? Okay, here's my question to you. You want a good use of your money? Don't worry about Apple too much. Look at the companies which are really, look, I like Apple. You know I'm not in love with Apple. So, don't have this fixation with Apple. Apple has Apple is looks like it. It honestly, Apple looks like it wants to go test his. You know, buy Apple around 156. So I wouldn't be wasting my time. Of course, would I? Would I trade Apple? Sure. Uh, but to 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 look at to avoid companies which are printing big numbers, and to give you some recent examples. Look at companies like Tableau Software. Data. That stock is destined for 90. I mean. Apple's chart is broken right now from a technical standpoint. So sitting there thinking what Apple will do, and like I explained, yes, Apple's growth has not ended, but don't have a fixation with Apple. And, you know, seriously, Apple right now is broken the 34. Apple is a solid buy, in my opinion, at the 155, 156 level. In the meantime, I just like I've been showing my other things like the squares and stuff, like NVIDIA. I'm very, I'm very bullish on it. Could be wrong on that on earnings. Companies like Twitter, Twitter is just screaming by 
on the technical front. This is a broken chart right now on a weekly basis. On a daily basis, will it bounce? Apple broke its 150-day SMA. However, here's the good news for traders. There's a nice gap here, if you guys notice, right? Nice gap. And that gap comes into play at there, 157. So 156, 157, I will be very excited to buy heavily on Apple. Could be dead wrong. Apple probably takes, Apple probably turns around and Apple has a lot of big buyers, right? Big buyers. So Apple could possibly turn around from the one, uh, 160 level and just go straight up to 163 because it does not give away its, its long standing, long uh, uptrend of the 150 day SMA that easily. So that could be a quick scalp trade. But technically speaking, this is where it would be a big buy point. Now take a look at this chart and take a look at my Twitter that I've been posting. All right. But Frank, but Frank, excuse me, I wanted to point out on Apple as well. Go ahead. Isn't the two hundred isn't the two hundred day moving average on the daily? It's about at one fifty eight. So if it breaks that, could it see lower? I mean, I'm thinking maybe if it breaks that, we go lower. Yes, you can. Absolutely. Remember, fund managers and stuff don't always look at like individual averages. You know, they look at many other factors. I don't use the 200 day because some of my other charts do. But on this particular one, I don't because I these have worked for me so well. So you can rest assured that off the 156 level, there will be a vicious bounce on Apple. That vicious bounce should be good for five or six points. Apple is not okay. a dead, dead stock. So what you just basically said, it breaks the two. Remember, how many times in the last 15 years? Have they said that the averages are broken, the market's going to deep dog depression? Every single time, even now, you see those guys come out and say it. Every time a major average breaks, like a 200 day, what does it do next? Can somebody step up and tell me? What does it do in the following week? Bounces. It bounces and- It bounces off of it. It, it. it takes it back. It wants to go back above it. You get it? So right. that you can trade. Now, if it fails the second time, that's when the be that's when things get hairy. You know what I'm saying? But generally, when you lose a major moving average, a real company like Apple will try to retake it back. That's called the dead cat bounce or the reflex bounce. Then you watch the reaction of what goes on. Now, looking at Apple from a weekly standpoint, each one of these lines are still trending higher. Have you seen any indication of any of these lines starting to do this? No. When you start to see this visual, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to worry about numbers and moving averages. When you start to see visually moving averages start to do this on the weekly, that's when you know you are in for a month, uh, multi-month decline. None of that has been detected. End of story. Now, the, 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 so giving another example, Tom, talking about better usage of money, okay, from a standpoint, not to say that you can't trade any of this, you can trade anything. Look at the weekly chart of Twitter. The weekly chart of Twitter just on basic, basic Fibonacci. Candle after candle, after pullback, reversal hammer. It's telling you 29. Stock at 26. It, it was up to, on Friday, it was up to 27.42. Okay, or the day before. These calls are cheap. They cost 30, 40, 50, 60 cents. It's telling you it wants to go to 29, if not this capitulation level of 32. The megaphone is a very bullish pattern. I don't know if it's going to work. The megaphone will only work if Twitter gets bought out. If Twitter gets bought out, you can rest assured they're going to pay between 36 and 40 bucks or $38. But here's a much better looking chart. Big buyers. Show you another one. Data established itself. You know, we have traded the stock before. It's been slowly moving higher. This is a weekly chart. So it cuts out a lot of the all the hourly and daily noise. Look at this beautiful upwardly trending channel, which some people will say is still in a bear flag. Because that's what a bear flag, you know, bear flags are like this, and then they start to bounce. 
You honestly believe with the numbers that data Tableau software delivered and the amount of buying that happened on the worst day in the market in God knows how long. With Dow Jones down almost 700 points, this stock hit a new 52 week high. It's honestly, you're telling me that it's not going to break the 90 and head towards 100? It's hard to believe. Will it find resistance at the channel? Absolutely. But what is the channel? 89. You make five points a day. That's more than you'll ever make an Apple. That's how you got to think. And if data does get a buyout bid, they're going to buy this baby at 130. Mark my words. Big data analytics. Big time stuff. The stock was $131 after IPO. And we have played these swings at certain times. And we played it on earnings. And it was, I went through the earnings, phenomenal. But forget it, I'm not an analyst. I will not be an analyst. I refuse to do that. Bottom line is, even on a short-term trade, if the markets were fine that day, we'd have seen 90. Pre-market, it was actually at almost at 80. It was at um, 93. Bingo! It actually hit 93 after hours. At 5 p.m. on Thursday. Wake up time, traders. The stock went from 77 to 93. I actually wasn't concentrating as I was looking at Google and stuff because I had some common. But still, it went to 93. You're telling me on a market bounce, it can't go back to 93? I mean, that was, the, that was like shorts just getting blasted. But you get not six points on it. That's all I got to say. You got to broaden your horizon. Apple's fine. But Apple is controlled completely, 110%, Tom and everyone else by machines. Apple is a heavy weighting on the Dow. But I'll tell you one thing, Tim Cook he ain't stupid. He watches the market like a hawk and they will pull some stuff out of their, out of their uh, arsenal and blast the heck out of all these guys who are saying that Apple's a done deal. On that note, broaden your horizons. Look at these other ideas. They're cheaper, they'll make more money for you and that's always there. Let's meet tomorrow. Futures are down about 15 and a half. And that's the last thing we'll look at. And everything we talked about today is going to be coming true. The downside and the upside. I can assure you that. So now you know the roadmap. Be prepared. We hope they don't have another government shutdown, which is looming this week. I hope that both parties, okay, both parties, I'm not going to pull some political punches here, come to their frigging senses because I'm getting pretty sick and tired of some of the garbage I'm hearing. All right. This is not a personal vendetta against this or that. I have very strong feelings on certain things. I'm a hardcore capitalist. I believe in American business. I don't believe I believe in God. I don't believe in people. So I'm hearing some of the stuff that's coming out on both sides and in making me a little pissed off. And that's not good. Because if they keep on doing this, this market's going to fall a lot more. So for the sake of the country, our great nation, they need to come to their frigging senses, both parties. On that note, have a great Super Bowl Sunday. Whoever wins, wins, right? It's, 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 it's a battle of the champions. God bless you all. See you tomorrow. Thank you for attending.